Well, we use the term artificial neural networks, and I really, really very strongly dislike that term. And in this video, I'm going to explain why. And you will also learn a bit about the field of neuroscience, which is an amazing and fascinating area of science. Now you should know that I am a neuroscientist. That's my main job. So I admit that I have a slightly biased opinion here. And to be clear, deep learning is amazing. I am a huge fan of deep learning, but calling the units of these deep learning models artificial neurons is just, it, it's just so horribly wrong and outdated and insulting really to, to real neurons. And I think people just keep doing it as a, purely as like a cheap marketing scam. And by the end of this video, you're going to know why. And I think you will agree with me that artificial neurons that we use in deep learning have basically nothing whatsoever to do with actual neurons in your brain. So let me start by telling you about real neurons. Here you see a pseudo colored neuron that is reconstructed based on a staining technique. So basically you fill the neuron with fluorophores and then you use light microscopy to image the cell. So this orange ball in the center, that is called the soma or the cell body. And these arms sticking out here are the dendrites. And you can see these tiny little dots all over the dendrites. Those are called synapses. And that's where the neuron makes physical contact with other neurons. Here you see a different image of a different neuron. And now all of the synapses are color coded in pink. So each neuron can be physically connected to hundreds or thousands of other neurons. Now, most of these connections are with neighboring neurons, but there are also long range connections between neurons that can be millimeters or even centimeters away. These are beautiful pictures, aren't they? If you would like to see more, you can search the web for something like microscopy neuron or you know some related terms. Microscopy is from microscope, of course. Now, we talk about neurons as if they were one thing, like there's one canonical neuron, but you can already see from this example that these two neurons are quite different. In fact, no two neurons are the same. Indeed, there is an incredible diversity of neurons. There are probably hundreds or maybe even thousands of different kinds of neurons, like different species of neurons. And I say probably because we actually don't have an established taxonomy of neurons. That is, we don't even understand all of the incredible rich complexity of the categories of neurons, let alone all the details of how neurons actually work and how neurons truly compute information. Here you see a few examples of different neurons with different morphologies or sizes and shapes. Different kinds of neurons also have different activity patterns, so different ways of responding to electrical input stimulation. And also different neurons have different sets of molecules. And this is relevant because the molecular signature of a neuron determines in part its function and its structure. And we also use these molecular signatures in the lab to identify different types of neurons. So here you see uh, some reconstructions of neurons mapped out in the brain. So this gray area here outlines the mouse brain. And these are a couple of neurons that have been stained and visualized and then mapped on top of the mouse brain. So you can see that some neurons have huge branching across the entirety of the cortex. Now these lines are actually made much thicker here for visualization. In fact, the mouse brain has 70 million neurons. So they're very, very thin and packed really, really tightly together. So this taxonomy here shows one attempt to form a hierarchical categorization of some of the different types of neurons. This taxonomy is based on molecular markers and also physical locations in the brain. But this is not the only way to try to group neurons together. We can also try to group neurons together according to their shape, their morphology, according to their patterns of connectivity with other neurons, their molecular markers, as I've already mentioned, 
and their functional electrochemical properties. This is a really hard problem. Categorizing neurons is a really hard problem, and it's not even clear whether there is an actual solution. Now, there is an entire field within neuroscience called computational neuroscience. Computational neuroscience has the goal of trying to understand some fundamental neural principles by simulating neurons on a computer. These are the real artificial neurons. These are truly artificial neurons. These really deserve the name artificial neurons. Here you can see incredibly spatially detailed, morphologically accurate and physiologically accurate models of individual neurons, which are then organized and connected using principles that we know exist in real data, principles of connectivity that exist in real brains. These are incredibly detailed simulations, and it usually takes minutes or maybe even a few hours of computation time just to simulate a few milliseconds of data. So what do real neurons actually do? What kinds of computations do real neurons actually implement? So I'd like to give you a little bit of a sense of the kinds of computations that neurons are capable of implementing to our current knowledge. Now, you already know the basic idea of the math of each unit of a deep learning network, where those units are often called artificial neurons. Those units compute a weighted sum of their inputs, which is then passed through a nonlinearity. Real neurons, actual biological neurons, have a small arsenal of computations that they can implement, including coincidence detection, which is basically like a correlation coefficient, logical operations like AND and OR, filtering or attenuation, which means that uh, this dendrite or this component of the model will only respond to information that comes in at a specific temporal frequency. This is similar to the way that a radio can be tuned to one frequency to listen to or to hone in on one radio station. And then we have segregation or amplification, which means to take two inputs and accentuate their differences to make them even more distinct. This is like a subtraction computation. So these are some of the fundamental computations and they are all taking place simultaneously in a single neuron. And that's because these computations are actually taking place in the dendrites and not in the soma, not in the cell body, the main part of the cell. And it gets even more complicated because the impact of these dendritic computations on the output of the cell change over time depending on various features including the history of the activity of that cell over the recent time period. So here in these plots you see the voltage traces showing the outputs of a cell and you can see that the amplitude of each successive spike, each one of these is a spike, this is a jolt of electricity coming out of the cell, that amplitude is decreasing over time and the rate of that decrease depends on whether the input into the neuron is fast or slow. Now, needless to say, artificial neurons in deep learning models don't do anything like this. And the simple weighted sum that artificial neurons actually implement isn't even something that real neurons do, at least not at that level of simplicity. But wait, there's more. It gets even more complicated than this. This is a diagram of the membrane of a neuron. So the thin lipid bilayer that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. This lipid bilayer is impermeable. So molecules and atoms cannot pass from the extracellular space into the intracellular space. But the membrane has many gates that are built into the cell wall, and these gates can allow certain ions or charged particles to pass into and out of the cell. Now, different ion channels have different chemical and physical and electrical properties, and they are selective to different types of molecules and different types of ions like calcium and chloride and sodium and potassium and so on. 
These gates are regulated on different timescales and they are affected by different genetic factors and they can also interact with each other. So some channels will open only when the neighboring channels are already open. So the complexity of even a single brain cell is pretty wild. Okay, so that was all about real biological neurons. Now let's talk about artificial neurons. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty disappointing, don't you think? After learning about the mind-boggling complexity and the amazing beauty and diversity and computational repertoire of real neurons, to call this thing a neuron, that, that it hurts, you know? It, it's just, it's painful to me. It's like comparing a stick figure drawing made by a three-year-old to a da Vinci painting. So where do these things come from and why do we call these artificial neurons? Well, the artificial neuron was developed by McCulloch and Pitts, who were a physiologist and a mathematician. Now, the thing is, I don't mean to be insulting or critical or derisive. This was amazing, genius-level work for them, for these two guys, to think up this model. They did this work in the 1930s, and neuroscience was barely a field back then. There was so little that was known about neurons, almost nothing was known about neurons. And these guys did not have any good experimental techniques. They had no real way of collecting data about what individual neurons actually do. So this model was not based on a lot of data and detailed experiments. It was based on some extremely crude measurements. And mostly it was just based on their imagination. So these guys really do deserve a lot of credit for coming up with this model. But that doesn't mean that it's still a good model today. You know, like the Wright brothers invented the airplane, but that doesn't mean that it's a good idea to keep using their airplane design. So yeah, this model was developed almost 100 years ago. And that was before we knew about DNA. That was before we had powerful microscopes. I mean, we had microscopes back then, but they were basically just glorified magnifying lenses. The placebo effect hadn't even been discovered, so there was basically no good medical research at this time. No MRI machines, and you know, the list goes on and on and on. My point is, these guys did incredible work, but we have learned so much about biology and neuroscience in the past hundred years that it just doesn't make sense to call their invention an artificial neuron based on what we now know and how neuroscience and biology has developed as a scientific discipline. And now let me explain how wrong this actually is. I'm going to make a claim that a blender is a good model for a human being. I mean, you know, a blender, the thing you have in your kitchen, the kitchen appliance, a blender and a human are not exactly the same thing, but hey, at some level, they are basically the same. Let's, let's see why, let's explore this. So here we have a blender and here we have a human. This is me actually, this is a picture of me teaching a workshop at a conference while my brain electrical activity was being recorded simultaneously in real time using wireless EEG. And that EEG signal was trans transmitted to a computer that was about five meters away doing real time analysis. That was pretty fun. Okay, but anyway. A blender is basically the same thing as an artificial human being. So let's think about it. A blender, just like a human, you put solid or liquid food in and processed food comes out. I know that's not the nicest thing to think about with humans, but you know, it is true. We put solids and liquids inside us and processed food comes out just like with a blender. That's basically what a blender does. We make noise, you know, blenders make noise and us humans make noise. I'm doing it right now. And we use electricity. The body runs on electricity. The brain, certainly, all the muscles and the heart, everything in your body uses electricity, just like a blender uses electricity. Well, obviously, you see how ridiculous this analogy is. A blender is not a particularly useful model for a human being. But, you know, human beings are amazing and blenders are amazing. Why do we need to say that one is a model for the other? It, it's just crazy. We can appreciate the importance of and the usefulness of blenders without having to compare them to something like a human being. 
you know, and, and who really cares about all of this stuff? The thing is, no one debates whether a car is a good model for a horse, right? Nobody looks at their car. Nobody's considering buying a car and they say, well, you know, which car is a better model for a horse? And no one does that. Likewise, you know, you don't buy a plane ticket and you think, oh, I'm getting inside a bird. This plane is basically a model for a bird. You know, they share some similarities. They fly through the air, but we don't, we don't have, it's ridiculous to even think about having this kind of discussion. Technology is amazing. Cars and planes are absolutely amazing for what they are. They don't need to be like anything in biology for us to be able to use them and for them to be transformative for human society. And I would go even a step further. And I think that if we continue to yoke technology to something in biology that's only slowing us down and preventing us from making better and faster improvements. So I think, you know, as soon as we stop saying that a car is a model for a horse, then that gives us the freedom to develop better, safer, faster, and more efficient cars. Exactly the same thing for deep learning. If we can stop saying that deep learning models are supposed to be like the brain, then that frees us from that stupid, ridiculous constraint. And it allows us to be more imaginative and more innovative about developments in deep learning. On, yeah, so all of that said, the, the word neural is built right into the terminology. We call these things artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks deep neural networks, artificial neurons, it's all over the place. And unfortunately, terminology is uh, ha has a way to be sticky. So it's really hard to change terms once they've been established. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something new about real neurons. Now, to be totally honest, the terminology doesn't really bother me that much. And of course, there's really nothing that can be done with it. So this statement here is, a, it's a little bit of a joke. It's, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. But I do think it's important to appreciate that the artificial neurons that we use in deep learning are really nothing at all like real neurons. And even more importantly, I think it's important, it's critical to continue developing and working with deep learning models as an amazing and awe-inspiring technology with incredible potential for improving human society. Thinking that a deep learning model is like a brain is only going to slow down progress and annoy and confuse people.